Hello, welcome to AT&T Threat Track for November 29th, 2012. This program provides network security highlights, discussion, and countermeasures for cyber threats. Uh, welcome, and joining us on the program today, we have Patrick McKenna, and welcome back, Patrick. Uh, I guess you're joining us from the uh, beautiful state of Washington, is that right? In the beautifully wet, miserable, cold, gray state of Washington, yes. <laughs> Well, it's not much different here in New Jersey, and uh, we also have uh, Michael Singer joining us from New Jersey. Uh, thanks for joining us, Michael. And uh, I'm Brian Rexrode. Today's uh, discussions, we have several things that we'd like to share with you today, and let's go ahead, and this is actually, uh, I think, going to be uh, an interesting topic, one that I certainly don't know too much about. Uh, Patrick, you wanted to talk to us a little bit about software-defined radio, is that right? Yeah, um, I'm going to just do a brief overview of software-defined radio um, to talk about uh, a topic that's really important to us. Uh, it has had a lot of implications for GSM uh, technology in the last uh, two or three years. Um, but, in fact, there's a lot of advancements that are happening in the open source community uh, that have implications for other things like RFID, uh, keyless entry for automobiles, um, things like uh, keyless entry for uh, for buildings. And so I just wanted to t take a second to talk about some of the pieces of hardware that are out there that are affecting everyone and um, kind of give you guys some insight into some things to be looking at when you're looking at various wireless technology. Cool. So um, to start, we're going to have a very advanced uh, uh, threat track performance because I'm going to move back and forth between some slides here at the beginning to show you what some of the hardware is. but. Um, for starters, um, from, from the, the slide, the software-defined radio is a, a radio communication system where components have been typically implemented in hardware uh, are instead implemented by means of software on a personal computer or an embedded system. And that's just a straight quote from Wikipedia. Mm -hmm. In the good old days, before we had really, really fast computers, it was very difficult to do any kind of perturbation or interrogation of wireless technology. And the reason was is if you wanted to go and do anything with a particular slice of spectrum and a particular protocol, you needed to modify the hardware for the actual platform. Mm -hmm. um, with software-defined radio, you can actually implement filters and, uh, and different demodulators actually on the PC in software. So you can make changes on the fly without having to pull out a soldering iron. And so that has had some pretty big implications. There's right now in the open source community, there's kind of two major areas of activity for software defined radio. Um, the first is uh, the universal software radio peripheral, peripheral. This is a device from Edis. Um, there are kind of three or four major um, versions of it from that company, um, and they have different performance benefits. Some of them are network based, some have a better bus, some have integrated peripherals. Um, but this is an example of, of what a universal software radio or a universal software radio peripheral looks like. And uh, some interesting things about it, it has two antennas. Um, so if you wanted to configure it for both transmit and receive, um, you, you can do that. Uh, in this case, I've only got one antenna attached because I'm doing sniffing with this work. I don't want to be doing any broadcasting. Um, but you, you can see there's a gold antenna adapter right here that I could attach it. Mm -hmm. um, one of the interesting things about software-defined radio um, and the peripherals involved is that you need to have hardware that works in the different frequencies that you're going to be doing any kind of investigation in. So the USRP, the way that they handle that is they have different daughter boards for different types of, uh, or for different slices of spectrum. So on this guy, I've got some, some daughter boards that work in the 900 megahertz spectrum. So we can do things like investigate false space station technology or, or, or ways to discover false space stations. Um, because uh, the GSM signal for our network um, in some areas works in the 900 megahertz spectrum. Um, you can get, get different daughter boards that work in like the 1800 megahertz spectrum. Um, there are some that work for a very large swath of spectrum. I think there's, um, it, there's a, a WRX that works from somewhere between 200 megahertz and 1800 megahertz. It's much more expensive to get those daughter boards. Um, but, again, that, that gives you a lot of flexibility. So in, in, in our world, um, we spend a lot of time worrying about, like, you know, cellular communications. But these devices, they can be used for a lot of different things. There are some projects out there where people are sniff, sniffing satellite uh, communications. They're grabbing weather satellite images with a, a USRP. Um, there are others where they're looking at how keyless entry works for cars. Mm -hmm. So there's a lot of different interesting ways to, to wield this technology, and it just requires 
um, you know, acquiring the right daughter boards. Mm -hmm. um, so a USRP goes for about, uh, you know, when you're depending on what daughter boards you're looking at, um, anywhere between you know a thousand and two thousand um, dollars. And that's, that's kind of a high barrier to entry. Um, one of the other interesting pieces of technology that's out there is uh, there's a, a project called uh, Osmo RTLSDR. And um, they have uh, this device. Um, this is my uh, NewSki DVB-T-USB receiver. Um, this can be used for collecting terrestrial television signals for a high-definition television and playing them back on your computer. And some enterprising hackers realized that uh, this thing actually can do receive and transmit between, I think, 66 megahertz and 1,700 megahertz in spectrum. And so you can actually use this with a project called GNU Radio to do all sorts of experimentation. Uh, this device is only about $40. And so um, this kind of has opened up a whole new area of uh, hobbyist research in, um, in uh, software-defined radio. Um, it's basically limitless in the sense that uh, you no longer have to get a specific radio itself for a particular technology. You may need to get different uh, daughter boards for uh, different pieces of technology so you could play in the right spectrum. But we're also starting to see that there's some hardware out there that has a pretty broad swath of spectrum to be able to do any kind of interrogation. Um, so that, that makes things a little bit more interesting. There are a lot of new technologies that are in play for investigation. Uh, SDR can be used for lots of different technologies. So uh, we look at it a lot about false base stations, but this could be for keyless entry for automobiles. Um, and you could actually, if you wanted to, you could roll your own Wi-Fi stack, um, any kind of mobile communications for things like uh, mobile weather stations, et cetera. Anything that does RF for communication is suddenly in, in play with, with this new technology. Mm -hmm. um, the prerequisite for major reverse engineering work is, um, is whether or not there's an implementation of a particular protocol for an SDR. So if you're looking at some new technology for entry into your building, for example, um, and no one has implemented uh, any kind of protocol for that technology on SDR, the researcher is going to have to start from scratch and actually roll out their own protocol. They may be able to see um, the, the changes in an RF performance for the particular device, um, but actually interpreting what that means is going to be a little bit more difficult. Um, what's interesting is you can just use FCC uh, databases to, to go find out information about what a piece of hardware is, um, and usually that gives you enough information to start the, the process of reverse engineering a, a device. Um, you know, the, the last thing I would say is, you know, when you're investigating any new wireless technology, so uh, I, I'm not really looking at things like Wi-Fi or, you know, uh, mobile telecommunications, but things like keyless entry for, for buildings or any kinds of, like, um, Zigbee or, you know, really... Uh, alternative local area networking technologies, you might want to take some time to look at whether or not there are SDR implementations for that particular technology because uh, you can be pretty much assured at some point there's going to be some uh, curious researcher who may be looking at those protocols and you want to understand kind of whether or not your particular technology has been beat up, beaten up on uh, by anyone who's playing in that space. So um, that's, that's kind of what I wanted to say about SDR. Uh, it's 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 very uh, obscure to me. I, I'm a computer science um, a network engineering background. That's, those are m where my, my degree is. And, uh, you know, to go and play in this space suddenly requires that you have to have a little bit of RF theory and electrical engineering background. Uh, and it, it, it really is difficult. Uh, but I think, uh, you know, people who've got the curio curiosity will find this stuff really interesting. Yeah. Yeah, it's very neat. The, uh, so the, uh, perhaps I'm sort of restating something that was uh, obvious to you, but uh, I want to make sure that uh, it's clear to our audience. So there's really kind of a, uh, a, a, a good side to this, a blue side, and there's kind of a gray side of this that we need to be kind of thinking about. I think your perspective is very clearly, you know, understanding how this technology works, how it can be used, and in, in, in particular being able to evaluate uh, products that are on the market and make sure that they have the proper security attributes associated with that. But at the same time, as you you know, it's also a monitoring capability that could be used in a uh, in a malicious sense to uh, perhaps. And in fact, uh, we had talked about uh, some time ago. Some folks had done a study, and you may recall specifically who it was, but 
Uh, they had done a study and found that the, uh, the messaging that was used for uh, controlling cars, uh, unlocking the doors, was entirely unencrypted. So, uh, yeah, in that particular instance, they, are, they were actually using the USRP to investigate how the messaging protocol worked for that particular device. Mm -hmm. And uh, you know that, that that's you know it's one example. There's there's no way to prove that anyone's going to use a screwdriver for for good things for all particular purposes. Um, the GNU radio project and a lot of the SDR stuff initially. The the way I first found out about it like four years ago was seeing people that were just sniffing pictures off of weather satellites, and I just thought this was one of the coolest projects I'd ever seen. And I think in general most of the SDR community is out doing good things and trying to. To you know, do things to develop open source technology, uh, but you know, screwdrivers are powerful, and you know, in these cases, these SDRs can be used to do really dangerous things. So it's 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 double edged sword, just like all technology. And, and I and very much appreciate you bringing that to our attention. That is, you know, what I think is important here to take away is that uh, this this notion of security by obscurity is really diluting more significantly as we go. There's a significant uh, open source community that can provide software tools and uh, these kinds of capabilities where the processing power is, uh, is uh, sufficient to be able to do software-defined radio, it breaks down some of those barriers. And you pointed out very significantly that that $40 device uh, provides you some capabilities that can be brought to the table. So uh, we need to be more focused, and, and it sort of emphasizes, as I see, sort of the undertone here, uh, the uh, need for encryption technology to be in use in any kind of radio communications. Exactly. Completely right. Very good. Well, thanks very much for that, Patrick. I thought that was a, uh, a certainly an original type of presentation for this uh, for this show, and uh, very much appreciated. So, with that, I'd like to transition here over to uh, discuss some of perhaps some of our more uh, t traditional types of activities that uh, w that we cover on this program. And uh, in particular, uh, there's a, a report that was recently released by. Uh, Kaspersky Labs, and uh, this is a, uh, a what they titled a Global IT Security Risks uh, Report for 2012. And in particular, um, this is a survey that was conducted of uh, about 3,300 security, excuse me, 3,300 IT professionals. Um, and uh, one of the things, I mean, there are many things in that report that you might want to take a look at. It has some, uh, I wouldn't call any, uh, most of the information particularly uh, uh, groundbreaking, but certainly uh, it helps to reinforce uh, common perceptions about what uh, the concerns are and what the issues are associated with cybersecurity. But as I stated, one, one of the things that uh, I found to be uh, kind of interesting about this report were just a couple of little things that were picked out from different parts of the report. One is that, as I mentioned, it's uh, based on a survey of 3,300 senior IT professionals uh, in, in 22 different countries. And uh, another part of the report, report pointed out that 50% uh, of those people that were, uh, were surveyed identified cyber threats as uh, on average of 30, uh, uh, on average the uh, second most important thing that they're concerned about as IT professionals. Now, I think what's important here is that these are IT professionals, not necessarily security professionals. And, uh, and then later in the report, they also point out that 31% of those surveyed admitted they'd never heard of, about any of the most common cyber threats, including direct threats to their companies. So uh, what that sort of suggests is that among the uh, most important aspects that they're concerned about, a lot of the folks uh, perhaps need to even learn more and would be uh, even more, you know, uh, concerned about security threats or cyber threats uh, if they uh, understood all of the uh, concerns that they should be. So I think uh, there were some others that have uh, pointed out the fact that there is a need for a greater amount of education among IT professionals as well as uh, generally among uh, folks that are in the uh, 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 basically using IT services. So I don't know, did uh, anybody else in the group here have any uh, observations that you'd like to share about this report? Maybe we need to go on an educational campaign hacking that 80% of the people who are not very concerned with cyber threats. Um, I think there are plenty of folks out there doing that, actually. <laughs> <laughs> 
And that's uh, exactly the kind of thing that we're concerned about. There are other statistics that are included as a part of the report, including uh, uh, some cases about what you had suggested, Patrick, about things that, um, uh, you know, cases where information had been thought, lost or they had been uh, a victim of some sort of a cyber threat. So. Um, again, I, I point this out. This is uh, a report that's worth taking a look at, and it's available online. Uh, with that, uh, I'd like to go ahead and pass the reins over to Michael here. And uh, Michael, I should uh, welcome you to the, to the program. Thanks for joining us today. And uh, you had found a report related to recent denial of service attacks. I know we've covered this a little bit here, but I thought you had a, an interesting and a little different perspective than we've talked about previously. Yes, you know, this has been a year with lots and lots of DDoS attacks uh, and very large DDoS attacks. And there was uh, kind of a provocative report saying that, you know, we really need to adapt our defenses because these DDoS attacks are evolving. And I won't say that, um, that what I heard from some of the, you know, industry experts on this was really that new and different. We've seen attacks like they described actually for over the last few years. Uh, but they did make an important point. And that is that um, there are volumetric attacks, and there are ways to deal with volume, and there are effective measures that, that uh, will protect you. But there are also the low and slow activities. Mm -hmm. and, and their point was really that you could actually see both of those at the same time. And we have, in fact, seen you know, volume by itself, low and slow by itself, and we have seen the two of them at the same time as well. Uh, and the low and slow attacks um, are the ones that I, I would wanted to draw some attention to. Um, you know, I, I think in our talking points with customers, um, that's at the forefront is that DDoS service against the volumetric stuff is, is a necessity, basic level of protection. But in addition to that, you also need to be worried about your application, about hardening your application, protecting your application, mm -hmm. and it, you also should expect low and slow types of attacks in addition to the volumetric attacks. Absolutely. And so uh, just to sort of reiterate on some of the things that I think we've talked about in previous programs, um, as you suggested, the low and slow type things, they, there are two flavors that I'm specifically aware of. One is that there's some sort of exploit that has been patched uh, that can be a lever to be able to basically cause a denial of service on the platform. And uh, we've talked about a number of those uh, associated with maybe toolkits that are used as a part of web servers or actually vulnerabilities associated with the web server itself. And so obviously you want to make sure that you're keeping your systems up to date in terms of patching. And uh, a second one is uh, what we, I describe as a sort of a back-end loading type attack. And uh, in those cases, it's a case where, you know, you might have some type of a uh, URL that causes a, a back-end database search, for example. Sometimes search engines can be ra rather processing intensive for the systems. So one of those types of attacks will be that the, uh, you know, the attackers are sending lots of search requests to the, uh, to the platform and trying to uh, load down the back-end. And some of the recommendations that we've been making is to prepare uh, what your strategy will be under attack. That is, if, uh, if you are under attack, what aspects of your site, your web services, can you turn off and still keep the critical functions in place, whereas, uh, and then disabling some of those functions that might be intensive or might be abused in the, in, in the course of attacks. And uh, we found that that was effective for some uh, folks that were, um, you know, planning on that sort of thing and had prepared for it and, and used those types of mechanisms. So uh, those are a couple of important things. I think another thing that, uh, if I recall correctly, John Hogeman had pointed out previously is uh, don't size your servers for peacetime operations. Size your servers for a situation where you might be under attack. So even if you have a DDoS defense solution, it may be able to knock down 90% of the attack activity, but you'd still need to absorb some of that overhead and the systems need to be sized for it. I don't know, Michael, did you have any others that uh, come to mind as well? I think th those are some great points uh, of advice. Uh, the only other thing I would mention is it might make sense to have uh, one of your security teams uh, scan an application, throw the latest stuff at it, and then see if they find any weaknesses, uh, especially your most important stuff is Internet facing. Yes. All right, very good. And uh, I guess the next item is uh, I guess we have to start debating whether or not it's, uh, it's a good idea to patch right away. 
Yeah, there is there's an announcement uh, that uh, in an underground forum there is a, an exploit being sold a zero day for the latest uh, Java, uh, Java version seven. We're actually on update nine. Um, and what was interesting about this uh, is that it doesn't work on version six and prior. Uh, so people who aren't as up to date with their Java won't be vulnerable. Uh, but as people get their auto updates and click through it, they will become vulnerable when they go to version seven. And then you see the kind of reinforcement of the the uh, running it like a business, where the person who found it is advertising it in an underground forum and asking for the highest bidder to take it off his hands for a one-time purchase. And presumably, it will be included into other kits and tools. It will be made more widely available out on the net uh, once that happens. Mm -hmm. You know, I think we, uh, I think the article that flagged this or we're showing is uh, from Brian Krebs and, and his uh, blog, Krebs on Security. And um, I think uh, if you're not already familiar with this, uh, you know, specifically for not just the Java topic, but familiar with uh, Brian Krebs' work, uh, he's certainly one that's worth following. Not just because his name is Brian, but uh, I find that he has. Uh, Oftentimes, insights that others don't uh, are, are talking about or haven't uh, shared or haven't got the insight into. So he's a pretty good investigative uh, 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 reporter associated with uh, security activities. But uh, I think to he your gave point. Um, I don't know. I guess I think this is a relatively unusual situation. How often do you have a new version of software where the zero day works for that, but when, then we find that it's uh, it doesn't work on previous versions of the of the software? Uh, I, I I gotta disagree, Brian. This, this might be the first the first time we have a major conflict on the show. There's always new functionality added to software during patches. Uh, that's true. That's true. And so I mean I I don't think this is really that unusual. Um, you know Java has had a pretty storied history when it comes to its security vulnerabilities, and uh, you know this is just a, an instance. I I don't know anything about the specific details of this exploit. I haven't looked at the uh, anything that's that's released. But I I would assume that we're looking at just some relatively new code that was added to to, to the patch. Um, generally, that will happen for new functionality, and it maybe didn't have the best standard of security engineering behind it to make sure that they weren't doing something that they shouldn't have. Well, and in fact, it's probably true that many patches, particularly ones that are associated with bugs even, not necessarily just security patches, uh, get pushed through the process perhaps a little more quickly than they might get pushed through otherwise. So uh, there may be some uh, testing steps, regression testing that, uh, that could get bypassed. So I, 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 I'm not in disagreement with you here, Patrick. <laughs> this is one Good, I don't have to throw my chair. <laughs> Uh, but I think is uh, probably more often than not, um, you know, applying the patches is uh, was still what our recommended practice would be. I don't know. Do, do you disagree with that? <laughs> I don't know. I mean, yeah, no, I think, you know, it's important to try to be as up-to-date as possible on the patches. Uh, I would say that in general, um, you know, my personal habit with my machines at home, my not my work machines, mm -hmm. is usually give – a patch about a week to let these kinds of issues work themselves out. Because I've, I've run into plenty of times where I went to the latest and greatest piece of software and I lost a piece of functionality that I needed, uh, or I later found out that they needed to roll something back. So I try to find a balance for my personal stuff, and the rest uh, I, I you know submit to the corporate whim. Okay. Well, I think that's uh, that's a good balance. You chose a week. Uh, even a few days is probably pretty effective if it's a, uh, a, a well you know, a, a popular piece of software is going to get uh, tested in the community fairly quickly. Um, we certainly wouldn't want to be waiting months before we uh, reapply our patches, I would presume. Not at all. Okay. <laughs> so, uh, actually, very good. In fact, I think it's, uh, it's very valuable to consider what the, uh, the trade-offs in circumstances like this might be. So let's uh, go ahead and take a look at some of the events that have taken place on the Internet over the last week or so here. Uh, this is our uh, Internet weather segment of the report. And um, the, the first item that uh, kind of showed up on the top of the list, and this was actually posted as a uh, Internet Protect Alert, so Internet Protect being a, uh, a service that uh, where we can provide alerts out on events that uh, are showing up on the, on the Internet. But this happens to be related to scan flows on port 54321 TCP. And uh, I don't think it's a registered 
uh, application associated with this port, but I did find that the Oracle VM managers associated with this port. Now, and uh, some of the more historical information, uh, this uh, port was associated with uh, back orifice, which was a uh, actually uh, uh, an application that was basically a remote access or a, a, a access uh, application that was uh, considered um, sort of on the malicious side of things. But uh, certainly uh, the, the Oracle VM manager, uh, virtual machine manager would be one that would be one of, that would be concerned about as well. So this particular activity, uh, we're showing 30 days of activity here, and the activity that we saw started right around uh, November 17th near the end of the day. Uh, it was a pretty big spike in uh, scanning activity, and it was just a few addresses that were participating in it at that time. And that continued for about two days, and what we saw was actually a very um, a strong correlation between the number of probes or the number of flows that were associated with this probing activity uh, with the number of packets. Now, starting on November 20th, uh, the number of flows and the number of packets started to diverge. That is, the, uh, the packet to flow ratio went up. And uh, you can see here where I'm sort of flagging that point where they diverged and you see this uh, blue line being the number of flows and the uh, red line being the number of packets associated with this probing activity. Now, what that happens to correlate with here is a, uh, uh, the introduction of, of additional machines that were performing that probing activity. So it, uh, it appears that what has happened here is uh, the initial probing may have been some uh, investigation to see if it's worth uh, uh, continuing this activity to see if there are, are hits on this port, for example, and uh, later what they did is uh, employ a botnet to start doing that activity. In fact, it appears, in fact, that, or perhaps at least, that uh, some of the machines or, or hosts that they've uh, found uh, accessible by this port, they've recruited into this botnet. So this may be, in fact, a botnet recruiting activity that's going on. So from the few addresses that we saw previously, uh, it's expanded to roughly eight cloud service providers. Now, among those eight or so cloud service providers that uh, were identified in this activity, uh, about 1,000 or 1,500 or so uh, machines have been participating in this activity. So there are many addresses in each of those, uh, not all of them, but in some of those uh, cloud service providers. So perhaps they have an underlying um, uh, a problem with their service or for a, uh, a hole that is being taken advantage of in this case. Most of those hosts are U.S.-based hosts, and there were a handful of them or a few of them in China that were associated with this. Now, that's hosts that are being scanned or doing the scanning? Oh, these are hosts that are doing the scanning. Okay. Well, and they've, uh, they've uh, for lack of a better way of describing, they've joined into the fun here. And, and did the, was there kind of two distinct areas of activity here where you had uh, like a cloud service provider doing the scanning to discover whether or not there were vulnerable hosts and then afterwards botnet-based activity? Uh, yes. Yeah. So in the, in the previous activity, it appeared that it was just a few addresses that were participating. And then uh, subsequent to that, it's, it appears that they recruited additional machines. Now, the, it's not clear if that was an existing botnet that, the, uh, that these, I'll call them attackers here, have had basically hired to do this activity, or in the course of the scanning activity, they were able to exploit machines and recruit, recruit them into a botnet as a part of this activity. But, you know, obviously they're scanning around for some reason. My assumption here is that uh, they're doing it to exploit machines and to build a botnet with that. Yeah, well, what seems interesting to me, and I don't know if I'm just running with something here, but I wonder if they're separating their botnets so that if they have a problem with their botnet, if it gets closed down, that they don't lose complete access to all of their hosts. That, so, that is a common practice associated with the botnet operators. So they will segment off a portion that they use for recruiting purposes or drafting machines into the botnet and then they will uh, move those over to a botnet that actually gets used for some sort of attack activity. Yes. That's very interesting. I, I learned something today. <laughs> that makes a ton of sense. Yeah, so that's not uh, – I, I don't have specific evidence of that in this case, but that certainly is a possibility that's existed. Now, the next item that we'll talk about here is uh, related, again, scanning activity. This is an increase in the flows being of scanning activity on port 5902 up through 5906. Now, 
uh, we oftentimes have reported, and I think it will show up even in our pie charts later on here, that port 5900 is the one that's really kind of registered to VNC, that's virtual network computing, which is a remote access protocol. And, uh, but if, um, if port 5900 is used, uh, there are alternate per ports that VNC will use uh, sequentially, 5900, 5902, 5903, et cetera. And so what it appears here is that uh, this particular uh, actor or set of actors is actually targeting specifically these alternate ports uh, under the assumption that they might be able to find additional machines that they had missed otherwise that would be uh, otherwise in inaccessible for them. So in this particular case, I'm showing only 10 days of activity just to reduce the clutter a little bit here. Uh, but you can certainly see the trend of activity. And uh, what we're seeing here are actually, if this is a composite of activity on each of these ports. And uh, what we saw is some pretty heavy scanning activity on p port 5902 for a period of time. And this was around uh, the latter part of November 23rd into November 24th. And then uh, sort of what uh, basically happened is, and there are only a couple of sources, source addresses that are associated with the scanning that is initiating the scanning activity. And uh, what they did is add in additional ports to see if they could find some things in other places. So you can see there's a strong correlation uh, for these big spikes where each of these colors represents uh, the individual ports that are being scanned, and there's a strong time correlation of start and stop of that scanning activity on these ports. Again, uh, only a, a, a few addresses are really participating in this activity um, from areas around and uh, near Russia. So, so, Brian, we've seen scanning on 5900, I think, uh, a lot over time. And this is oh, somebody... Yeah. Just continuously, yes. <laughs> and this is somebody being creative and saying, well, I, I'm going to mine even harder than the other people by cleverly going to the other ports that VNC might use in addition to the one that, that everyone else is also looking for them to be on. And sad as it may seem, there's uh, likely competition for ga capturing bots that haven't, or, you know, capturing vulnerable machines that haven't already been captured by others. And so it, I, I think that sort of uh, uh, emphasizes your point about being creative to find other avenues where they can uh, capture this, you know, exploitable machines that are using this protocol. And most, more often than not, the, uh, the exploit in this case is password guessing and maybe, in fact, just trying, um, you know, some simple passwords or the default passwords associated with these applications. Uh, the next item here we'll take a look at, this is an increase uh, in the number of flows on port uh, 5038 TCP. I think this is actually scan flows associated with this, as it's scanning activity. Uh, there was also an increase in the number of sources that are scanning on this port. Uh, it's, uh, and we've reported these kinds of uh, events previously. This one's a little bit different, but not uh, entirely different. Uh, it's associated with the asterisk voice over IP management application that is, uh, this is a, basically a, an interface to PP access, for example, uh, that would be used to uh, manage the voice over IP capabilities. And uh, typically what we'd expect in this case is these are folks that are trying to capture ac access to uh, PBXs, uh, be able to um, use that for fraudulent purposes, that is be able to uh, make long distance calls where other countries require access charges and be able to reverse those charges to the owner of the PBX effectively. Um, so uh, this is not an unusual type of uh, activity, certainly one that we've seen in the past. Um, but there was a sort of a surge in that activity around uh, November 24th in terms of the number of flows as well as the number of sources that were uh, uh, doing this activity. Yeah, so people need to tighten down those, those VoIP uh, solutions. Uh, just speaking as a, as a carrier individual, someone who's been affected by this, uh, there are a, a lot of fraud actors who are very interested in, in gaining access to uh, and owning various uh, VoIP solutions. Because mm -hmm. they end up recording uh, spam messages and then blasting them out to you know however many customers they can before the, the account gets cut down. So if if you're running your business, you don't want to see your um, your phone number shut down because uh, you've got someone internationally who's using your phone solution to market, for example, I don't know, bail bond solutions by spamming everyone in the four two five area code. Uh, these are bad things, and <laughs> it's only on the rise. Yeah, absolutely. Good points. Thank you, Patrick. 
Uh, uh, let's take a little bit of a uh, quick look at sort of the distribution of activity that we're seeing taking place. Um, as usual, we have uh, some of the, the regular ones. I thought it was kind of interesting here. This is looking at a basically a pie chart of the most probed ports. And uh, it's not atypical here. We had about 631 in the other category here. But that's uh, actually a little larger than we typically have seen. Uh, but in any case, uh, it, it's, you know, it is what it is. Uh, we're also seeing port 445 TCP is the t top of the list. That's fairly typical. Uh, port 1433 is on here, port 3389. Those are all very typical, port 22 and port 23. And as we have been reporting, uh, there are a number of ports here. This is 16471, 16464, and 16470, all UDP. All of those are associated with the peer-to-peer -peer activity of the zero access botnet. So those aren't actually reconnaissance activity per se, uh, but it shows up in our uh, reconnaissance analysis. But that is peer-to-peer uh, -peer communications associated with one of the most prominent botnets that's uh, on the internet today. Uh, next one, a little different perspective here. It was kind of interesting, uh, and we're going to take a little closer look at this briefly on um, port 23 TCP. That actually uh, won in terms of the number of sources that are probing on that port. Uh, port 445, the standard one, again, this is, this is uh, generally config uh, infections that are, uh, or botnets that are mimicking that. And we also see port 210 TCP showing on here. This is, uh, as we've been reporting for many weeks, uh, that is peer-to-peer -peer activity associated with the, uh, the security surveillance camera botnet that we've been reporting on. And uh, so, and then we still have port 3389 and uh, also port 80 TCP showing up here. Port 80 showed up on the uh, previous one as well, possibly looking for uh, websites that are exploitable. So let's take a really quick look at this port 23 activity because that is a, a, a little bit more prominent than we typically have seen. And yes, indeed, we have seen that uh, over the last week or so, starting around, uh, I guess more persistently, right around the uh, perhaps this 15th of November, uh, an increase, a significant increase, in fact, in the number of sources they're probing on, on uh, port 23 in a more consistent manner. So we had some spikes around the 6th of November, 5th of November or so uh, where it spiked up, but it's uh, been pretty consistent since then, since uh, actually November 15th um, in terms of the number of sources. And this has gone from a baseline of roughly, say, 3,000 or so sources that were probing going up to on the order of about 15,000 or so sources they were probing. Um, and there is a daily or a diurnal cycle associated with that. So uh, certainly, as we've said many, many times before, you want to pay attention to exposure of telnet to the internet. Um, if you're forced into doing it, make sure you have good passwords. And what we definitely recommend, at the very least, access control list that is accessed from specific points if you need to do that. And uh, just a little different perspective here, I took a, uh, a sample report of a specific hour of activity and uh, took the top 874 addresses in this particular case. There's no significance to that number, but just these are the most active ones that were of the 15 or so thousand that were scanning on that particular port and uh, mapped them the geographically. Now, the way this graph uh, works here is a red dot basically indicates there's at least one host at that point. Uh, if there are multiple hosts at that particular point, it'll turn more toward the yellow side. So you can see sort of the hot spots here. Uh, we had a uh, hot spot, for example, out in the uh, uh, southern Midwest or, or central United States here. Uh, there are a couple of hot spots down in uh, South America. We have a pretty hot spot in uh, Egypt and several pretty hot spots out in, uh, in a, I would say, even a, about a dozen or so of those in China. So uh, there are some hot spots associated with this activity. It appears that uh, there are certain um, uh, devices that are being exploited uh, because there are, in some cases, I noticed one in particular in Egypt where there's basically one a provider of services that seem to have many, many addresses associated with that. This wasn't an ISP, it was actually a hosting provider, so it looked like they had some uh, systemic problem associated with that activity. So with that, uh, I think that brings us to the end of the program. Any final comments from the group here? Love that weather report. <laughs> every, every week it is one of the most interesting things I've seen. 
Uh, it is uh, one of the unique things, one of the reasons we save it for last to, to hopefully keep our audience around for a little bit. But thank you, Patrick. And I'll keep watching. <laughs> yes, thanks. And uh, that's our show for today. Um, if you'd like to get in touch with us, so you can contact us through email at threattrack at list.htd.com. Uh, we certainly encourage your, your feedback, your comments, and uh, I at least got some feedback here from Patrick today. appreciate that. Uh, this program is available from, in video from att.com slash threat track, as well as on YouTube. Just search for the threat track program. It's also available in audio form in iTunes and uh, FeedBurner. So uh, I'd like to thank you, Michael, for joining us today, Patrick for joining us today as well. I'm Brian Rexrode, and uh, we'll be back next week for another Threat Track. And until then, please keep your network safe.